<laughs> okay, it says we're live, so you can go for it, Casey. Okay. Well, welcome to our uh, discussion on uh, sciatica. This is uh, Therapedia. Um, I'm Casey uh, McNitt from Therapedia Denver, and um, we're going to be talking um, about sciatica, what causes it, um, different diagnoses, how we diagnose it in, diagnose it in physical therapy, um, how we treat it, and maybe how to prevent it as well. So I'll just kind of let everybody um, introduce themselves. Maybe Josh, if you want to start. Uh, so I'm Josh Hardy. I'm a physical therapist at Therapedia Denver as well. Um, I've been practicing for just about five years. Um, and yeah, we see sciatica a lot. And uh, it can be a challenging differential diagnosis, but we're going to explore that today and hopefully clear some stuff up. Hi. Hi, I'm Shenna Caperton. Um, I'm a physical therapist and clinic co-director at Therapedia Tampa. Um, I've been working for about 10 years now, mostly in outpatient orthopedic settings. So I've seen a little bit of everything, sprains and strains, to post-surgical, to sports rehab, to the geriatric population, and obviously a whole lot of sciatica in 10 years. Hi, and I'm Cherise Rose. I'm a clinical co-director at Therapedia Tampa. I've also been practicing for about 10 years, almost 11 actually, and seeing the gamut um, from low back pain to toe replacements. And uh, today I'm looking forward to sciatica, uh, talking about that and educating the public on injury prevention, diagnosis, and treatment. So uh, again, my name is Casey, and um, I am I'm one of the PTs and um, a clinic director in Denver. I've been practicing uh, for 13 years now um, with a specialty in um, trigger point dry needling over the last like five or six so that may come up um, towards the end here in terms of treatment for sciatica um, especially because we can do it in Colorado and unfortunately um, Sharice and Shauna can't yet do it in Florida if I am correct right? Yeah. Yeah. No. So someday hopefully soon but um, anyway uh, so I'm going to start um, the discussion just talking about what is sciatica and um, the different types of um, sciatica that we see in um, the PT setting. Um, there's four kind of common types of sciatica I guess you, you see, but um, we'll get into that in a second. So, uh, but in general, um, sciatica is kind of a general, I don't know, I call it, kind of call it a wastebasket term in terms of um, something that uh, describes either like pain or weakness numbness or tingling that radiates down the back of the leg, um, typically one-sided, um, but sometimes we'll see it bilaterally or both sides. Um, but it typically will always follow kind of the pattern or the distribution of the sciatic nerve, um, and uh, which it can come from a, a lot of different sources, but um, typically you see it anywhere radiating from the back down the buttock. Um, and into um, the back of the leg and all the way down into the foot sometimes. Um, the four, uh, four common uh, sources of sciatica that, that I see, um, and I'm going to pull up some pictures as we go here, so if it, um, it's acting crazy, just let me know on your end. But um, the first one being, um, actually I'm going to pull this up now. Hang on a second. Are you guys able to see that at all? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So the first one being like a disc herniation or a disc protrusion is a is a very common um, source of sciatica. Um, as you can see in the picture, um, the disc between the vertebrae is pressing um, into that space where the nerve root um, comes out from the spinal cord. Um, the disc can be a, a protrusion where it's just kind of a slightly pressing on the nerve, or a full herniation where the disc is. Uh, basically kind of erupted um, and uh, the body responds by creating like an irritation or an inflammatory response um, that can cause symptoms to kind of radiate down the leg following the particular path of that um, of that nerve. Um, the sciatic nerve tends to follow the path of like L4 through S3 so you'll usually see that um, distribution L4, 5, S1 down the back of the leg typically. Um, so that's disc herniation, disc protrusion. Another um, picture that kind of shows it here. Um, you guys see the second picture here? Yes. 
So the disc protrusion is the um, you know the third one down, which is a little bit smaller, a bulge of the disc, and then the herniated disc. Uh, the fourth one down is obviously a much more significant uh, rupture of that disc. Um, the sec so disc herniation being the first, the second um, common source of uh, of sciatica would be what's called foraminal stenosis um, or lateral stenosis, where the foramen or the space where the nerve comes out, which be the white in each of these pictures starts to um, narrow um, for several reasons. Uh, one uh, common one would be what's called degenerative disc, uh, where as we age we start to lose a little bit of the fluid in the discs and um, this disc starts to um, decrease its height. So if the height decreases here, then you tend to lose space here. Um, degenerative discs or stenosis you typically we'll see in a little bit older population. Um, you also will see it um, come up sometimes in pregnancy um, because of the increased curve through the low back here um, as a woman, uh, as the pregnancy progresses, um, that tends to close that space down as well and can create uh, pretty uncomfortable radiating symptoms down the, down the leg as well. Um, another source of um, stenosis would be like bone spurs or osteophytes that might develop uh, within that space as well, again, narrowing it in, um, in certain positions, causing um, pressure on the nerve. A third common diagnosis or a common source of um, sciatica would be piriformis syndrome. And um, in piriformis syndrome, there's a deep muscle in the buttock that basically travels across the, the, the deep buttock. And um, in 85% of the population, the sciatic nerve lives underneath that muscle, um, as you can see here. In 15% of the population, the nerve will either like split the muscle or it'll wrap over. There's just some sort of anomaly with how the nerve is passing, uh, the sciatic nerve is passing um, through or around the piriformis muscle. And um, various you know, issues that I see with piriformis syndrome, you know, repetitive activity, um, uh, compensation from um, weakness in another part of the glute muscle causes uh, contraction of that piriformis. Some people um, in a prolonged sitting position, um, either the pressure from sitting on a chair or the wallet or a hard, you know, hard chair or just the stretch that's on the piriformis will bring that on. So typically with piriformis syndrome, I tend to see a lot. Um, uh, I'm going to turn off the screen share real quick. I tend to see a lot of... Um, piriformis uh, syndrome in the gym setting where we work right now um, because it is a very active population but then usually one of the things that I look at first is that they always complain of um, issues with like driving or sitting for long, for long periods at work. The last um, common one, the, the last common one that I see that's a little more specific I guess to dry needling and trigger point dry needling is um, referral pain from the um, from the glute minimus in particular. Um, there's a new picture up here with the trigger points. You guys can see that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I really started to discover this about five years ago after when I started needling and realized what a huge role the glute min trigger points play on um, the sciatica type symptoms, that radiating um, achiness, pain down the leg, and you can see in this distribution of these trigger points that it can radiate all the way down into almost to the ankle. Um, and um, glute minimus, you'll find huge tender trigger points. Um, it's sometimes a little bit hard to differentiate glute min and glute med, but they it typically is that you'll find a huge knot um, located just uh, lateral, um, just on the lateral part of the hip, and um, it's usually easily reproduced when I'm dry when we use the dry needling, which are little acupuncture needles to stimulate those trigger points. Patients will almost always say, "Oh, that's." that's the symptom or that's my pain that's going down the back of my leg. You can um, reproduce it while you're sitting there typically. But, um, so trigger point referral pain um, is the fourth, uh, the fourth most common thing that I, I see in PT. Um, questions on any of that? I kind of breeze through it, but no. if everybody's good, um, let me throw it to Josh then, and he's going to discuss a little bit on how do we differentiate some of these different um, uh, ideologies of, of uh, sciatica. Okay, so <clears throat> as Casey said, um, first one that we tend to think of is discogenic pain, and as he, as he showed with those pictures, basically the disc is pushing back into the nerve root, 
and causes the irritation or even just the, um, I guess, complete interruption of that nerve sig signal. Um, so how we, how we figure out if that is what's going on, a lot of times the patient's subjective complaints will kind of get you headed in the right direction. Um, one is if sitting is worse, and I always think car, especially, you know, car versus truck, just with how low the seat is and how that will induce that, that flexion on the lumbar spine, which will then squish the disc back into the nerve root. Um, another common one is if they say that they're really uncomfortable sitting on their couch, you know, something that should be comfortable, where, again, if you're sitting on a couch, you're most likely not having the best posture and allows that, that flexion of the lumbar spine and, again, the, the squishing of the disc back into the nerve root. Um, one way to, to know, you know, for sure if, or I guess not for sure, but to give you a really good idea is imaging. You know, obviously an MRI will show oftentimes, yes, the, the disc is protruding and is, in fact, pushing on the nerve root. Um, and sometimes a less, a less expensive and more utilized uh, way to look at it would be just an x-ray. A lot of times, even though it doesn't show the disc, you can see that there's not adequate disc, disc space, which then could... Um, you know, you could infer from that, you know, maybe there's a little bit of a bulge going on or you at least know that the disc doesn't have its, uh, maybe the structural integrity that it should. Um, one test that we use a lot is kind of a repeated motion test, and this is McKenzie-based, um, which, and I know there are some people kind of go, going away from the, from the McKenzie model, uh, but if you think about it, I, I just feel like mechanically it makes a lot of sense. So oftentimes you can do a repeated flexion test, and if, if someone goes into flexion, you know, I usually do five or ten times, if they get that reproduction of that sciatic nerve pain, you may think, okay, they're squishing that disc back into the uh, back into the nerve root and causing that pain. And then a lot of times if that is the issue, then some repeated lumbar extension will kind of ease that pain or ease that irritation. Um, another test that's commonly used is kind of a neural tension uh, slump test, and you guys are most likely familiar with that, where you just have the patient sit, slump with really bad posture, um, and then extend their leg, and that's basically making the, the nerve root take the longest path from the brain stem to the tip of their toes. And if, uh, if it is indeed irritated, and that'll elicit that pain along the sciatic nerve distribution. And then when they bring their head up out of that slump test, it gives a little bit of slack to the nerve, and then they feel that, that irritation kind of ease a little bit. Um, along the same lines is the supine straight leg test, where the clinician actually passively uh, flexes the hip, keeping the knee extended and the ankle dorsiflexed. Um, that one is has, has good sensitivity. Sensitivity is at 91%. So... Basically, you can say with fair certainty, if, if that is negative, if that straight leg raise does not elicit pain, you feel pretty good that it's it's not a disc that's causing the issue. Um, unfortunately, the, the specificity of that is not very good, so it's, it, it doesn't do a good job of ruling in the disc as the, as the culprit. Um, so again, with the disc, you can kind of look a lot at does flexion-biased activity cause reproduction of their symptoms and can kind of go from there as far as uh, if a patient may need further workup with their physician. Um, the lateral stenosis, spinal stenosis, um, again, the subjective complaints will a lot of time get you going in the, uh, in the right direction. With this, oftentimes people have more pain when they're standing and uh, that is again due to gravity pushing on pushing on the whole spinal column and causing that lateral framing to not be wide enough for the for the nerve root to pass through there. Um, again, this is seen more in, in our older population, uh, just because they get bone spurs, you know, forming in that lateral framing and can kind of pinch down on the nerve root there. Um, is it just me losing Josh, or are you guys seeing it? I'm having a little oh. bit of difficulty. Yeah, I, I am as well. It was fine up until just then. And he's a goner. <laughs> to get that neurological claudication, that, um, that pain. The treadmill is essentially like they're walking uphill, which will then cause them to 
walk with a little bit of forward flexion, thus opening up the foramen and uh, maybe decreasing. Yep. Are you guys seeing Josh okay? Now we can. Lost it for a minute? Yep. Yes. It's kind of, kind of cutting out on mine. And I'm not hearing anybody. Um, Let me make sure my internet connection is still good. We can hear you now. Kind of lost the Tampa, Tampa ladies. Oh, yeah? Uh oh. <laughs> We're still here. <laughs> okay, now I can see you guys. In sunny Florida. <laughs> can you guys hear me? Now we can. Yes. Okay. Okay, roughly the last thing you heard. Um, I think it cut out when you started talking about neurogenic claudication. Like it, I caught like the end of okay. that. Yeah. Okay. Let me let me just close this door really quick here. Okay. So are we good? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So as the individual is walking on a on a level uh, treadmill, they start getting that reproduction of their pain. Um, you then elevate the treadmill so that they are kind of walking uphill, which then will cause them to walk in a little bit of a forward flexion and open up that foramen, and then uh, hopefully a positive test would be if that neurological claudication kind of subsides. Then you're thinking, okay, it's indeed the, the foramen in a standing position that is that is pinching off that nerve. Um, similar to, you know, talking about re repetitive movements, sometimes I'll have people do either a prone uh, prop on elbows, and if it is the foramen, that will also will also pinch the nerve roots, or even just a standing repeated extension test. Um, and it's it's essentially just the opposite of the repeated flexion test that I that I talked about for uh, discogenic uh, discogenic issues. Um, the third, oh, and then obviously with stenosis, um, imaging can help you know prove or, or show with less doubt if there is uh, if it is the frame and where the nerve root is being pinched. Um, and the third culprit, oftentimes, is that piriformis syndrome. Um, I'm going to pull up, I found uh, this article that had a really great kind of classification for this. So we'll go. Here, and can you guys see yeah. that? Um, hopefully it's big enough or, or near big enough. Is that still okay there? Yes. Okay. So you can see here, um, Basically, there are these 12 items. Each one is worth one point. Um, if they score greater than eight, it indicates that it's probably piriformis syndrome. Uh, less than eight says most likely not piriformis syndrome. If it's less than six, they're basically saying don't even don't even think about labeling it as piriformis syndrome. So if you just kind of look through here, you see that the pain kind of fluctuates throughout the day. And, and that makes sense with, uh, you know, sitting, standing, moving. Casey kind of touched on that a little bit. Uh, they say no low back pain, no pain with palpating the spine, just trying to rule out, um, you know, low back involvement. Um, negative straight leg raise, prolonged sitting triggers gluteal pain. Um, again, fluctuating sciatica throughout the course of the day. Um, we have the, the FAIR test, which I always learned as the Faber flexion, abduction, internal rotation. Mm -hmm. Basically, that's putting a stretch on that, on that uh, piriformis, reproduce their pain. If so, then you're thinking, okay, this, this piriformis is pushing on that sciatic nerve. Um, palpation, easy enough. Palpate the origin and the insertion. Sometimes you can really twang that that uh, piriformis and get that reproduction of the pain down the leg. Um, an absence of uh, perineal irritation, and that's most likely, you know, alluding to kind of a cotoquina type type symptom. Um, so that was that was just a good example of something where it was all in one place. Hey, if you think it's piriformis syndrome, uh, 
run them through this battery of tests and, and see if you're above or below that cutoff of eight. Um, so I'll go ahead and stop screen sharing there. And then, uh, oh, and then the last one was um, the gluteus minimus. And again, Casey and I, we see this a lot. And uh, at times, if you feel that trigger point, I've had people where I can just really dig my thumb in there and get that to reproduce the pain. And the trigger point's far enough away from the actual sciatic nerve that you're, you're really confident, okay, I'm in the muscle belly of glute men. This is reproducing their pain. Let's go ahead and needle it. Or, you know, if that's not an option or if someone doesn't tolerate the needling, um, I've had some success, not as good, but some success with just getting in there with an elbow and really trying to get rid of it that way. But, um, yeah, oftentimes the needling is kind of end, ends up being a, a treatment and, and a diagnostic tool at the same time. Do you agree with that, Casey? It'll kind of, if you, if you needle it and it takes care of it, you think, well, that was the problem. Yeah, it definitely is like one of my go-to spots um, each time, regardless of, uh, you know, maybe what caused it or, you know, I always try to get to the glute man if someone's willing to do dry needling on that first session because it's a good way to kind of rule, rule that in and rule it out and I'm right off the bat, so it's really easy to do too, so. Um, thanks, Josh. you have anything else? No, that that was all I had unless anyone had any, any questions or anything to add. I, I do have a question. Um, how many patients are you guys seeing for dry needling per day? Is it a pretty big uh, following there? Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm really choppy on my end. Are you guys choppy? No, just a little bit. You're okay? Okay. I might actually switch spots. Hang on one second. I think it's both of us being on the same internet connection that slows down. But um, as far as number of dry needling patients, you know, we see, I would say 90% of my patients, we, we dry needle on a, on a daily basis wow. um, of those, you know, a couple, one or two patients a day dealing with sciatica. But, um, it's a pretty popular uh, treatment modality in Colorado especially, but becoming, you know, more and more popular across the country. So I, I would, I, I don't know what you think, Josh, but I would say probably 90% of my patients. The only ones we don't. Um, do dry needling with would be um, some of the early post-op patients, and then just some people don't like the uh, thought of, uh, of of the procedure itself or afraid of needles or what have you. But um, it's a good number for sure. It's like a great yeah, choice. I would say. Sorry. <laughs> I would I would say for me, and this is probably a product of I haven't been needling for as long as Casey, and I'm uh, currently only level one certified. I'd say I probably needle three quarters of my patients. Um, and yeah, that's that's just because there are, are limitations to what I can do um, in terms of safety with the lung field and you know we didn't get into uh, you know anything in the face or the or the foot. So um, yeah currently I'd I'd still say about three quarters of mine end up uh, end up getting needled by myself and if, if I'm unable to based on those uh, those constraints then I'll set them up with Casey if I really think that it's uh, a muscle that really needs it, but yeah, it, when I took that course, you know, a little over a year ago, it, it absolutely changed our practice. Wow. Exciting how many, things. How many sessions does it usually take you guys of dry needling before you tend to see results? Is it usually pretty instantaneous, or does it take a couple of times? For this particular diagnosis? Um, yes, I or would in say, general. You know, if we're talking sciatica specifically, yeah. I can usually get a, get a pretty good idea within, I would say, the first two sessions of whether it's going to be helpful or not. Um, the other thing, besides needling the glute men, um, we also will do dry needling for piriformis um, for, you know, an instant release of that uh, particular muscle. So if, if you have a piriformis that's kind of in spasm or it's, in, you know, just a hot spot, um, it works really well. And you kind of needle lateral, like off the greater trochanter, and then you needle off the um, sacrum. So, you know, you're nowhere near the actual sciatic nerve, but um, you'll get a similar response where someone will feel it going down the leg. And, but to answer your question, I would say I could get a good idea whether it's going to help or not within the first couple sessions. Okay. Yeah, and you can, you can oftentimes do, uh, you know, a quick test retest to kind of, um, you know, show some value in it. Uh, you know, just even looking at 
hip external rotation range of motion prior and, and post, the patient will go like, wow, that really did loosen up that muscle because look how much farther my hip can rotate now, mm -hmm. um, which is sometimes comforting to them since they just underwent a pretty painful uh, ordeal, so they like to see that hopefully it's going to move in the right direction. Yeah. Sounds good. I'm going to have Josh do one thing real quick. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like too far. It's going to move him a little bit, so we're closer to the internet. Okay. So, um, technical difficulties. Okay, sorry for all the delays, internet troubles, but um, maybe uh, later on we can see you guys. Uh, sorry, can you hear me? Now I can. Maybe you guys can demonstrate a little needling later. <laughs> Not a bad idea. Not a bad idea. Um, I don't know if you want to needle like anyone's glutes on camera right now, but no, like, not that area. Not that area. Bad. Yeah, Maybe we could try to do a quick thing at the end for sure. <laughs> the elbow. Uh, I'll do, uh, do Josh's elbow or something like that. Yes. <laughs> um, so I was going to maybe have uh, Sharice talk a little bit more about. Um, you know, are there any specific activities that might make sciatica worse or sport-specific issues that might uh, you, you kind of notice uh, increased sciatica diagnosis with? Yes. Um, well, I'm Sharice Rose, again, clinical director at Therapy of Tampa. And I have seen um, many people come to the clinic who do not know how to breathe properly. So, um, you know, I feel like Americans, people in general, are just really stressed and do not know how to properly take a deep breath um, using a diaphragm. So I found in my practice that um, I try to get them to engage their muscles um, through deep breathing. Um, I'll talk about a couple of different postural um, malalignments I see. I see a couple of things involved with some patients who sit all day at long at work, upper cross syndrome and lower cross syndrome. I don't know if you guys have heard about these two different um, syndromes, but it's pretty common. Um, a uh, psychologist, um, he termed the, uh, the term a long time ago uh, for this uh, syndrome. So upper cross syndrome um, is basically whenever someone is sitting for long periods of time, sustained postures, and they develop this tightness in the pec, um, weakness in the periscapular region, a forward head posture. Now, can you imagine um, the thoracic spine, I believe, is an underserved and overlooked area of the spine. Do you guys agree with me? I don't know if you've ever seen um, this measure, uh, mentioned in the literature, but it's a commonly um, overlooked area. So what I notice is that those patients who have upper cross syndrome really have reduced thoracic spine mobility. And when you have that happen, you lose the normal spinal angles that you need to have a healthy spine. So I try to facilitate, first of all, correcting the upper body, um, making sure that thoracic spine um, does resume some normal mobility and it's extension and flexion. I have them work on pec minor stretching as well as um, facilitating the deep neck um, cervical, the flexors, the stabilizers along the neck to make sure they're in a more of a aligned posture. Um, once I work on that, then I look below the chain where they're coming in, which is where their pain is, right? The lumbar spine, the sciatica, they complain about this pain they have all day long. So I try to think about what are they doing throughout their day? Are you sitting for prolonged periods of time? Are you standing at work? Are, are you sedentary um, after you leave your job? So I try to figure out what is happening for eight hours of your day. And usually the same response is sustained postures of sitting. Um, some people have long commutes to work, so then that is also an issue. So um, then you add the lower cross syndrome into that um, arena and, and, and you see this tightness on the hip flexor, the weakness in the glute maximus, you see um, weakness at the lumbar spinal extensors including the multifidus, um, and you also notice some tightness along the lateral trunk and uh, the quadratus lumborum is a, a side bending muscle along the lower trunk that attaches to the anterior lateral uh, vertebral bodies. So I find that those muscles are also restricted in um, your patient who have, comes in with sciatica or low back pain. So um, this upper cross syndrome combined with lower cross syndrome just makes for an unhealthy spine. So when it comes to lower cross syndrome, um, I try to engage uh, their lower abdominals through core stabilization testing. So um, in the clinic, I try to use the stabilizer. I don't know if you guys have that there in Denver as well, but um, yep. I look at it to measure transverse abdominus um, static um, strength as well as dynamic strength. So what I will do is have a patient come in and measure this uh, abdominal strength um, using these, this mechanism 
and usually they fail. <laughs> and, and once I find that this is very weak on them, I look deeper at their breathing technique. So I will take the patient through um, active breathing uh, demonstrations and have them try to engage their deep abdominals. Now, uh, re research shows that if you're engaging your deep abdominals more readily, then you have a decreased risk of low back strain, um, impingement, and pain. So um, when these patients learn to breathe more deeply using their diaphragm, they can activate the deep abdominals more uh, readily and actually in an order. So right, so there's an order to activation of these lower abdominal muscles. You have to activate the TA first prior to any other obliques and, and, uh, and other um, secondary structures. So I, I tell patients that, you know, once you leave your bed in the morning, the first muscle that fires is a TA. Before you put your foot on the ground, the TA fires first. So that really like takes their breath away because they really didn't think that deeply about this area of their body. So that's one thing I think uh, enlightens the patient is to make sure that they know what a healthy spine looks like and what it doesn't look like. Do you guys agree with that? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So um, back to the uh, postural alignment of the patient. I, I believe that attaining a healthy spine is, is key. So again, diaphragmatic breathing is something that um, I think is important, uh, reducing the incidence of upper cross syndrome and lower cross syndrome in patients and uh, our, our clinical patients as well as our wellness patients. Um, and then uh, once they're set in that position and have that um, spine that's, you know, a healthy spine for them, you know, of course you have like those of, of all backgrounds, all different body types. So you just have to make sure it's something that's um, something that's personal, something that's for a healthy spine for their particular body type. Um, then you know, of course, you have your athletes. So if I talk about a little bit of sports medicine now, a little bit, I see that um, I, I focus a lot on dance medicine, and a lot of golfers come in to see me at the clinic, and uh, I'll talk about this in a, in a little deeper. These are two rotational sports, um, so. I see a lot of issues in the spine in rotational sports because what happens is um, you're, especially in the golf posture, um, you're in this flexed uh, position in the golf posture and you're putting your spine at a more um, of a disadvantage. Um, the discs are under more strain with that flexion of the spine and I find that those who uh, leave work after eight hours a day go on the golf course and taking that lower cross syndrome, upper cross syndrome with them to the golf course. So then they're in a mild line position already at golf address. So they do not know how to re like correct this um, malalignment unless they come in and see a therapist like us, you know. So uh, you know, so sometimes they're coming in complaining about their golf game being a little bit you know, off. So and they do not know how to fix it. And they've tried things on their own, flexibility, uh, exercises, stretching exercises, but what they really need is actually hands-on, you know, techniques. So, and learning how to engage their abdominals. So, many structures get inflamed during golfing, uh, including uh, the disc, the facets, um, the muscles, and this constant torsion to the spine um, can result in annulus tears um, and really uh, big problems. So, you know. Famous golfer such as Tiger Woods has been through lots of strain along his low back, and uh, you know I wonder if he's tried dry needling ever. So <laughs> that'd be a question to ask him if things uh, like core stabilization training has been something he's tried um, in the past. Um, so with that said, um, the golf swing is a pretty uh, big, uh, you know, it's a pretty big forceful movement to the spine. Um, Secondly, as far as dancers are concerned, it's also a rotational sport. Um, you see a lot of um, dancers go into turning and uh, pirouettes, uh, you know, uh, jumping and leaping. And so this this same issue um, follows the dancer. Now, when it comes to dance medicine, I see that um, dancers are used to having a hyperextended position, so they're used to forcing, kind of turn out, um, compressing that SI joint. Um, I see a lot of SI issues actually, you know, localized at the SI joint. Um, so a lot of dancers come in because they have forced turnout for so long. Um, they're pushing their hip, hips forward into the um, into the hip joint and causing a little bit of anterior glide and uh, anterior hip instability. And so they force it. They they develop this short and uh, short and strong sensation along the posterior hip, but not long and strong. So I find that I have to re-educate these dancers on turning in is better than turning out. Um, sometimes to go ahead and uh, it helps with that length tension along the posterior hip. So once the hip is um, in a normal alignment, 
getting more turning in it gives you that length tension, that stretch reflex you need to get a powerful turnout. So a lot of the times when it comes to dance medicine, um, the sciatica is kind of localized along the SI joint. So I have to usually unload the SI joint. Um, they usually impinge through that region. And we've got to work on deep, pure formus release. Like you mentioned earlier um, in the talk, Josh and Casey, um, pure formus release, deep abdominal strengthening to get them out of that hyperextended position. Um, which they're used to. Another syndrome that we see in these dancers, which is um, along the lines of sciatica, is also something called kissing vertebrae, where their facet joints are impinged and kind of locked. And also we get sciatica symptoms from those regions too. So, um, you know, these rotational sports, they're fun and, and, and they're really like a low level of uh, injury and a little moderate risk of injury um, in these athletes. But, you know, most of the injuries are the low back. So um, sciatica is a big problem and the population of athletes, um, including, you know, football players and runners possibly. And, you know, so it is just, it's, it's an interesting concept that, you know, this is something that is kind of new to the population, you know, as far as like, no one's really addressed a lot of this uh, as far as like in the wellness patient. So um, it doesn't really get addressed till after the injuries happen. So I'm happy to be a part of like a therapeutic wellness network where we can actually address issues before they come become major problems. And I can talk for days, guys, but um, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, if you want Cerise, um, were you finished or did you have more that you wanted to go over? Oh, with no, that? I, I think um, hopefully I covered enough. What do you think there, Casey? Uh, do I, should I, I have more I can talk about, but I figured I, I covered a couple sports. Um, you can apply that breathing technique and core stabilization training to most adults and most you know children as well. So um, I know I think I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you kind of left a good segue talking about wellness um, leading up to the whole prevention aspect of sciatica. Um, unfortunately, not all causes of sciatica are preventable. We wish that they were, but um, a lot of our job is really education-based. So kind of going back to what everyone else has mentioned earlier, it has a lot to do with teaching the patient how to learn how to protect their spine. So we think about you know their activities of daily living and what they do on a daily basis and what we really want to do is teach them how not to put excessive strain on that lumbar area and to learn how to move correctly. So then that way um, the risk of injury is a lot less likely than it might be otherwise. Um, one big thing that I like to look out with patients is um, you know, whether they do a job that's very physical or whether they're a housewife or a stay-at-home mom is the way they lift or carry things. So whether they're lifting a heavy box or maybe they're lifting their kids repetitively throughout the day, um, one big thing that I tend to see is people tend to round a lot from the upper and lower back. They don't think about, you know, lifting more from the hips and the knees that we instinctively know to teach them as therapists um, and making sure that they're carrying things close to their body and not creating a longer lever arm where it's more stress on the thoracic and the lumbar spine. Um, the other thing, too, talking about sitting, because we mentioned that a lot as well, is that a big majority of the population now tends to be very sedentary because they sit at their desk at the computer for eight hours a day. And I find that very rarely do they get up and move around is, except for maybe bathroom or lunch break. So I like to just make sure that, that patients know that they have the option to get up and move around every 45 minutes to an hour if they can. Um, you also really want to make sure that they have a good ergonomic setup of their computer workstation which you would think would be instinctive for most people, but it's really not. Um, you know, do they have good lumbar support in their chair? Are their hips and knees close to 90 degree angles? Um, do they have their monitor aligned just so that, um, you know, they're promoting good posture from the cervical spine all the way down? So those are all really important things to look at. I usually um, hand out most of my patients um, a checklist straight from OSHA that tells them what exactly to look at at their workstation. And if they can check off yes, that's great. If they check off no, then I tell them to try and look at that aspect and see if that's something that they can change. Um, another big thing that people don't always think about is the way that they sleep. Because that's a good portion of our life right there um, is sleeping throughout the course of the night. So I try and um, talk to them about how do they usually sleep, how are they most comfortable. Um, I tend to find that a lot of people are unfortunately stomach sleepers, so and they don't know any better because they find that to be comfortable. But um, I try and teach them about you know to try you know it's a little bit easier sometimes to go from sideline to from prone to going straight from prone to lying on their back. Um, 
So I teach them about, you know, making sure if they're going to lay on their side to put a pillow between their knees and make sure the hips and knees are slightly flexed so their lower spine and their hips are in better alignment. Um, if they're going to sleep on their back, maybe just to elevate the legs a little bit um, to reduce that lumbar lordosis and take a little bit of stress off there. Um, other little key things that people don't always think about sometimes are like for gentlemen, like they'll tend to always carry their wallet in their back pocket. And so when they sit or like maybe they're in the car for long periods of time, their pelvis is going to be unlevel. And so that can maybe cause like sacroiliac issues. So sometimes something as simple as that um, can help resolve problems. The other big thing is just making sure that people tend to be healthy and exercise regularly in general, which is obviously where we come in is physical therapy. Um, you know, and if somebody is not sure what kinds of exercises they can do, obviously we're a good resource. Maybe they're not in pain now, but as wellness clients, we can give them things that they can work on to keep that, um, keep them healthy and keep that from being an issue. Um, Treatment-wise, you know, as PT, we've already mentioned a handful of things that, that we tend to do in order to treat this type of diagnosis. Obviously, we talked a little bit about the dry needling which Teresa and I both wish that we could do, but we can't. Yeah. So we tend to do a lot of hands-on stuff and manual therapy with our hands, um, trigger point release, um, you know, soft tissue mobilization, things that we can do from that aspect. Um, obviously, you're going to look a lot at strength and flexibility, so most people are going to have some core weakness. Um, you even want to think all the way up to the scapula because we want them to have good stability all the way down. Um, focusing on stretching, so if somebody's got a piriformis issue, obviously you're going to make sure that they have proper length tension all around the hip, so piriformis, glutes, hamstrings, hip flexors, um, and lots of times too, especially if somebody's had a positive slump test, another exercise that we might um, use are sciatic nerve glides, and obviously that's going to depend too on how symptomatic the patient is, so if that's an exercise that's really uncomfortable for them or reproduces the symptoms a lot, then they might be a little bit too acute for that, but if it's something as to where, you know, it's more just a strong stretch and we can get a little bit better extensibility in that nerve, then that's oftentimes um, something that we'll do. And you can do that a couple of different ways. Um, doing that type of stretch in the slump position is a little bit more aggressive, so sometimes we'll start supine with the person laying down and maybe keeping the opposite leg bent and then bringing the symptomatic leg and holding it at about 90 degrees and then just gently extending the knee to a comfortable point and then just gently flexing and extending the ankle for a handful of repetitions um, as best as they can. Um, but there are definitely any number of things that we can do as PT. Um, other things maybe that we haven't mentioned are if it's more of a spinal issue like a stenosis or a disc issue, um, if you have lumbar traction available at your clinic, lots of times that can be helpful. Um, if it's a stenosis, usually low load prolonged traction tends to work a little bit better. So they get they get a little bit more of that opening at the foramen. Um, lots of times if it's a little bit more of acute disc, um, intermittent will tend to work better where it pulls and then it relaxes and kind of goes back and forth like that. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I didn't know if you guys wanted to do a demo on the dry needling or maybe elaborate on that part a little bit more. Because um, I'm sure at least here in the Florida market, like, I mean, we know what it is as PTs, but... A lot of people here don't know what it is because they haven't really been exposed to that. Um, yeah, we can. Uh, so, uh, you know, in terms of piriformis and I mean uh, sciatica, you know, we kind of discussed that. I can kind of show you what the treatment would look like. Maybe demo it on uh, Josh's <laughs> arm or something like that. This yeah, just see. <laughs> um, but yeah, we can um, try to run through that. Sounds good. Real quick. Thank you guys for being so open to doing this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We got to get up here. Oh, you got. Yeah, two cameras going. I could probably actually. I could probably actually. <laughs> Camera, camera we're using. We got two, we got two at the same time. Which one are you guys seeing? That, that, what you just had it on was a better camera angle. I think it's um Casey's camera. camera. Yeah, I think it's Casey's, Casey's camera. camera. We need that one. Yeah. Then it should be. Yes. 
Perfect. Yeah. Great. See it? See it? Yes. Okay. So this is for tennis elbow, um, which we do a lot of. Sorry, hold on a second. Got an echo going. So typically we wear gloves, we've got the acupuncture needles. We make specific dry needling needles now. I haven't tried those yet, but um, be interesting to see what the difference is. And then typically you kind of you can palpate the trigger points in all muscles really, but it's all that's kind of the art of it is being able to find the spots. For the tennis elbow, I have them usually lift their middle finger. And then I'm on the spot now. Okay, that's good. See if I can get it on the right angle without stabbing myself. Yeah. So we just tap it in. It's right in right in the skin right now. If I uh -huh. zoom in, try to zoom in, we might be able to see it twitch, but we'll see. So under my fingers right here, I can feel the muscle kind of contract, and there's a twitch. You probably can't see it, unfortunately. But we just kind of move the needle around. It feels like a dull ache. What are you feeling, Josh? Yeah, it's aching down here and then actually going up to my shoulder. Wow. And so it's following. If you look up some of the trigger point referral patterns, you'll see those um, mm -hmm. these different referral patterns of each trigger point. Um, so that one's done. And wow. it feels achy. It'll feel tight, sore for the next little hour or so, probably hour or so. Some people longer, but... Um, it's a quick down and dirty on, on dry needling. Um, for piriformis and glutes, obviously, uh, you know, they're laying prone and drape them certain, you know, properly, and uh, it's really easy to find those spots. Um, and they're usually really reactive. You can usually see them, um, definitely feel them, and you'll get that immediate response going down the legs. So we usually kind of piston the needle up and down like that for about anywhere from like 10 to, I don't know, depending on how, bad, how reactive it is, like 30 seconds. Um, until that twitch stops because there's a chemical reaction that takes place with the acupuncture needle, with the needle that makes it um, basically shut down that trigger point. And um, then we do corrective stretches or exercises to try to prevent that from, um, you know, coming back. So um, in terms of piriformis or sciatica, it would be, you know, stretching, stretching of the piriformis or some, like you mentioned, nerve gliding. Um, and then obviously, like, all about stabilization and, um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> All about core stabilization, <laughs> and, uh, posture, and body mechanics. So, um, all right. So, now, is do you guys um have are they sore right after the procedure? Do you apply ice if they need it, or would that yeah, become almost better? always we apply heat? Yeah, we almost always apply heat right afterwards. Everybody's usually really sore because you get kind of get a lactic acid release when mm -hmm. it twitches mm -hmm. like that, and um, it's just a similar soreness. The people I usually tell patients it feels like you went to the gym and you know, whatever body, whatever body part you're treating, you know, if it's glutes, you know, it feels like you did a hundred squats. It just feels feels tight and a little bit um, sore in the glute for usually a day to two, maybe at the most. But we use heat to kind of increase the circulation in that area to help with some of that okay. post-treatment soreness. Okay. One other, um, since a lot of sciatica, you know, is from, like we said, uh, just diagnosis. And you kind of hit on this a little bit with uh, traction. You think about it, both of those conditions, the more compression you have on the spine, it's going to make it worse. So mm -hmm. a lot of times we'll needle the, the paraspinals because if they're really, really lit up and, and tight, then not only do you have gravity or their poor posture or what have you compressing the spine, you also have these muscles that are pulling vertebrae together even further. Okay. So we can get in and, and needle the muscles on either side of the vertebrae you know, the, the erector spinae and the, and the deep multifidae and can kind of release some of that tension and that can uh, take some of the pressure off the whole system as well. I see. So you guys try these manual techniques and dry dealing prior to the traction. Uh, yeah, you could do that. Yep. Yeah, it, it's kind of PT preference and I guess mm -hmm. it depends on the patient too on what you think would be best for that certain situation. So mm -hmm. I would say the majority of the time I'll do a lot of a lot of my manual work, like joint mobilizations and that type of thing, and before I needle, just because someone tends to be a little bit sore afterwards. But then again, uh -huh. 
I think Josh does a lot more after, uh, yeah. a lot of the mobilizations after the fact, and we both had good success that way. Um, it just kind of depends on what, if you think the person's probably going to be done after the dry needling, if they're, you know, there's, some people get very anxious and are, they just they want to be done with treatment, um, yeah. and they'll usually do it at the very end. So you kind of go either way, but I can see the benefits of definitely um, needling and then either doing, a lot of times we'll do corrective exercise afterwards if they can tolerate that. And, um, in fact, we have somebody coming in shortly who um, I, I'll needle glute minimus to, and glute medius to kind of wake it up and get it going, and then we'll do a couple of exercises um, that target that muscle specifically, and he has more of awareness. Okay, that's the muscle we're trying to get to work rather than some of the other compensatory muscles that he's been cheating with for a long time. So, um, okay. so. That's a great um, case, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, he's, he's, <laughs> um, so anybody else have any questions or... Or, uh, well, I don't know. Do we, do we have any active so. listeners out there in public? <laughs> I think it's just us. Just oh, yeah, I think so too. <laughs> I love well, this. Thanks Robert for the discussion. information, guys. I mean, yeah, we did a pretty good job. Yeah, for the last put it together. It Maybe we'll do a whole other one. Uh, yeah, needling sometime. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. This was fun. Let's play another one. <laughs> well, thanks everybody, and uh, good to see you. And um, hopefully, we'll see you again soon. Good to see you. Nice to meet you, Josh. Likewise. Likewise. Good night, guys. Good night. Good night.